Okay, hello everybody. Uh, it's Drew Wager here. Um, I haven't done one of these, um, what used to be called fireside chats, <laughs> uh, for quite some time actually. Um, just trying to remember what the last one was. Probably something to do with um, one of the elite books that I was writing a few years back. Um, so um, I used to use these kind of things partly in the old Kickstarter days for talking about um, what I was doing and hopefully getting folks to pledge for things. But that's um, that's. Um, that's a long time in the past now, and uh, moved on to a different set of novels, um, some of which you'll be familiar with, um, but there's a new one coming out, which um, obviously is The Lords of Midnight. Now, uh, what I thought I'd do in um, a series of videos, I'm not quite sure how many at this stage, <laughs> I think it'll probably be three, but it might be four or five, we'll, we'll see how it goes, is basically take you through um, what, this, the, what the game is all about because some of you probably will be familiar with it, but some of, you, some of you won't. And in the same way that some of you obviously know about Elite Dangerous, some of you probably originally didn't know about the, the original game that um, preceded that, um, that redevelopment. So you need to wind yourself back to the year 1984, which is when Lords of Midnight the game originally appeared. And um, back then, running on 8-bit computers, um, between sort of 32 or 48 or 64 kilobytes of RAM, so not a great deal of space to do anything, no disk drives generally in those days, um, um, unless you were extremely rich, <laughs> or you had rich parents. Um, I was only 13 years old back then, so um, and I'm not anymore. Um, but um, the games were obviously quite primitive. You know, an 8-bit computer, the, the resolution of the display wasn't huge, uh, nothing by modern standards at all. Gameplay had to be built into that 32K, 32,000 bits, uh, sorry, bytes of RAM. Um, and that had to be the graphics, the gameplay, the AI, as it was, um, any sound that the, the computer could potentially generate, everything had to be crammed into that small amount of memory space. It was quite a challenge for these programmers. And back in 1984, and, and a few years just before that, the, the home computer boom had, um, had taken off in a big way. Uh, and people were writing games, but quite often these people were just one-man bands. Um, later on, you know, four or five years after 84, back in you know, the late 80s, early 90s, became much more a, a brand awareness thing. You'd get coin-up conversions and you would get um, um, big brand names that were generating games of, um, you know, against movies, that sort of stuff that you'd be more familiar with today. But right back in the early days of the 8-bit computing, most, pretty much everything actually, was an indie game. Uh, you just had one guy would come up with an idea, he would write it, um, he would code it, he would put it all together, and he would try and sell it. And in those days, before the internet, sometimes it was just mail order, sometimes it was, um, you know, adverts in flashy magazines and so on and so forth. Pretty early, early computing days, but some fantastic games. Now, you know, um, obviously Elite um, came from this kind of period. Uh, here's my prized ZX Spectrum copy um, of the original game, as you can see, hopefully you can see that. Um, and um, you know, that's typical packaging as it was back then from a, for a premium game. This would have been, I think, £14.99, which was quite a lot back then. That's probably equivalent to about £45, £50 now. So that gives you an idea of the, the kind of cost of the games. And to contrast that, this one is Lords of Midnight. So here we go. This is the original box of Lords of Midnight for the ZX Spectrum as well. You can see that on the back here we have a, a nice graphical, uh, well, stylized map. Um, actually, in the bottom corner there, you can just make out 9.99, which was the, the price I paid for it back in 1984. Uh, which again, a lot of money. That's about um, again probably about equivalent to um, 40 pounds nowadays. So, a, effectively, an AAA class game, as it was would have been in the day. Now, um, no internet obviously in those days, so you had the packaging that sold you the game. And if I take a look inside this one, you can see a few things. Um, this here is a keyboard overlay which you would slip onto your computer you can probably just up there see my um, my trusty ZX Spectrum that's my, uh, that's my original machine um, I don't actually know if it works anymore because um, I haven't got a television <laughs> I can plug it into <laughs> apparently there's an HDMI mod that I can do it, but I'm, I'm in two minds as to whether to open it or just kind of leave it as a, as a as a memory of Halcyon days but anyway getting distracted, as I usually do on these things. Um, so, um, they, games also came with an instruction manual. How cool is that? This tells you how to play the game. What a novel concept. Um, and inside is a beautifully written 
um, put together uh, uh, you know, inst set of instructions. Um, signed actually there, uh, obviously started was there by Mike Singleton himself. Um, an introduction to the game, how to use the booklet, um, a story, came with a novella, sounding perhaps slightly familiar. This was relatively common uh, for some of the big, big games. They would come with a story that set the scene. You can see there's some nice artwork in here, if I can just find the next page. So, you know, it's it's been nicely done. So it's a quality production. They, you know, they spent a bit of time on the packaging. Um, because there, there was no internet, obviously, to advertise these things back in the day. So, you know, a good manual, quite a lot of pages in this particular one, uh, which tells you everything you need to know about playing the game. Now, that was just as well because the games came with no tutorials whatsoever. You were just literally thrust into the game and you just had to cope. So, in the case of Lords of Midnight, what you really had was a few instructions. You had your keyboard over there, which told you the main keys, and there's the map. And go defeat the evil bad guy. Um, and so that was pretty much where you were left. Um, the other thing, of course, that's in the box, um, which I, I, I love this, that's a cassette. <laughs> How retro is that? Um, some of you out there probably haven't even seen one of these, um, let alone actually use one. But this is how software was loaded into those 8-bit computers. No, well, you could get a disk drive, but they were fairly unusual because they're really expensive, sometimes as much as or more as a computer than you actually had. Um, so you just used a, you know, a common garden cassette player, you'd stick this in, press load, um, and then probably about five minutes later in the game of this particular game, uh, you would your, your game would be up and running. Now, the, the beauty of today, of course, is that you can you can run all this stuff on emulation. Um, so uh, to give you a little bit of a kind of tour of Lords of Midnight, just to contrast it with what else had gone before, um, I've actually got it running on an emulator over here, which is which is probably handy nowadays. So I have my, A, I can't get the spectrum down off the wall very easily. B, I don't have a telly, and C, we'd have to sit there twiddling our thumbs while it loaded for five minutes. So that's very, very boring. Um, so I'm just going to move you over here, and then we will um, have a look at Lords of Midnight. So I'm just going to contrast this, actually. This is looking at uh, Lords of Midnight here, as you can see. I'm just going to contrast with a typical adventure game of the time. Um, so I'm actually going to go over here. So this is this is a famous one. This one's uh, uh, based on, oddly enough, uh, J.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. And this was the Spectrum conversion for The Hobbit. Actually, it was pretty well done. Um, but it was very typical of the adventure games at the time. It didn't really break any hugely new ground other than a few characters that did move around uh, and do bits and pieces. So if I uh, kick this off, you'll notice what you get is uh, a little description, um, some items. Um, there's a, as you can see, there's a wooden chest. Uh, there's a curious map, Gandalf's about, and Thorin. And uh, Gandalf's just given me the curious map. Now I can open chest and uh, uh, Gandalf's opened the door for me, which is jolly nice. Uh, if I want to be awkward, I can close the door. Uh, Gandalf's taken the map back. <laughs> and if I wait, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, you'll probably find Gandalf starts talking about something and then I can wait. What usually happens here is Thorin will sit down and start singing about gold after a while, which is uh, very much. So Gandalf's given me the map. Um, uh, Gandalf says hello. So, okay, let's open the door. Uh, and Gandalf goes east, so let's go east, and uh, we go into a new location. And uh, on the ZX Spectrum here we get a natty little display of what's going on, which takes a little while to draw. Uh, look at those remarkable graphics there. This was this was considered pretty advanced back in there. This is high res uh, uh, ZX Spectrum graphics, by the way, just to give you some context. And here's your typical scenario. Um, to the west, there is a round green door, the one we just came through. Visible exits are east, north, northeast, and you can see Gandalf. Gandalf's gone north. Let's follow Gandalf. Um, we're in the Trolls clearing, so if you know your Hobbit story, you know all about this one. Um, uh, presumably there's some trolls here. Uh, the troll's carrying a large key. Uh, Gandalf's gone north, and the troll starts having a little bit of a conversation. Um, which obviously has been pinched from the book. Now, if you know the uh, story of the trolls in The Hobbit, you know that you have to wait until daylight comes in order to um, defeat them, so because they basically get turned to stone in the daylight, and um, we just have to wait for that. That's the way to solve this first puzzle in the game. So there we go, there's the troll's path. Um, visible exits are south. Um, there's a heavy rock door. We can't open that without the key that the troll has. So what we do is we wait, time passes, Gandalf says we're doing a great job, fantastic. There we go, we wait again. Gandalf's gone south. Well, we can't go south, because if we go south, we'll die, because the trolls will eat us. 
So we wait a little bit longer and day dawns. There we go. So now we can go south and surprise, surprise, it's daylight in the trolls clearing. Uh, and there are two stone trolls and there's a large key and we can take the key and onwards and onwards and onwards. You kind of see the way these games are. Now that was what an adventure game was all about. And that's pretty much what they all did up until this point. Um, what you'd have is maybe 50 or 60, uh, depending on the size of the adventure, uh, locations that you could visit. You would have puzzles to um, work out. And um, you know, that was the gameplay. They were, they were quite good fun. And this one, as you can see, is interactive. It, uh, it's noticed I've gone away from the keyboard and time has passed, which is, which is fine. Um, and sometimes some stuff will happen. Uh, most of them weren't dynamic like that, actually. This one was actually slightly better. The fact that you had little kind of NPC Gandalf and Thorin wandering around uh, actually was quite an innovation back then. Um, so a pretty good version of the game, um, really, uh, and, a, and a very popular conversion from you know, the original Hobbit um, book, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But let's switch back to Lords of Midnight. So here we have the first screen of uh, the Lords of Midnight. Um, the text on the screen is is um, is far less um, verbose than you'd find in your kind of classic adventure. What you're actually seeing is not so much just a description of the of the, of the location that you're in, but you're seeing what your a particular character sees from the location they're standing in. So unlike the um, you know, the classic kind of adventure that you just saw, where you get a static location and you might get some graphics, but you get a static image and you get a static uh, description. Uh, in Lords of Midnight, you don't get that. What you get is basically, this is what you see oh, from this position um, if you're looking, as you can see at the moment, southeast. So if I look east, I get a different view. If I look north, I get a completely different view again. And if I look west, I get something else. Uh, now, the nice thing here is if I move east, one move, you can see I'm a little bit close to the forest. And if I look back west, I can see where I came from. Um, here are my compatriots at the start of the game, um, all waiting for me to do their moves as well. And we can see the Tower of the Moon, which is where we were standing a moment ago. So unlike The Hobbit, where you maybe had 50 or 60 kind of hard-coded locations, what you have on Lords of Midnight is effectively a map, a grid map, um, 64 by 64 locations and we're actually sort of actually towards the bottom left of the map so the tower of the moon if i show you the map again uh, hopefully you can see this okay the tower of the moon is actually here this is where we're starting the game um, and uh, our ter territory if you like is pretty much the southern part of the map and the uh, the evil baddie that uh, we've got to combat is in the northern part of the map um, so a little bit on the story so what have we actually got to do well, Luxor has, as you can see, been revealed to be the Moon Prince, which means he has something called a Moon Ring, which allows him the option to control characters um, to do his bidding, um, if they're willing to do so. He has a son here, uh, which is Morkin. Uh, Morkin uh, is um, only just revealed to be his son, in fact, according to the novella that comes with the book. Next to him, you have Rothron the Wise, who is obviously a sort of wizardy sort of chap. And over here on the right, you've got Corleth the Fae. Now, the Fae are kind of an elven race um, who live in the forests at midnight. And Morkin actually here is half Fae. Um, Luxor is his father. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of lore about who his mother was. And his mother was, was one of the Fae. So he has that kind of dual heritage birth. At this point, the novellas have told you that um, the land of midnight has been cursed into everlasting winter. And you can see that fairly clearly on the Spectrum's wonderful character set because it gives you a blue sky and a, a nice white landscape, um, uh, hence the snow. Um, it's been cursed into everlasting winter by uh, a nasty chap who lives in the north um, by the name of Doomdark. And Doomdark um, has managed to do this by utilising the power of something called the Ice Crown, which has cursed um, midnight into this everlasting winter. And as the game opens, Doomdark is poised to send hundreds and hundreds of armies traipsing into the southern parts of your realm, ostensibly to completely wipe you out. Um, now, Doomdark basically can be defeated in two ways. Uh, one, you can rally a whole bunch of armies to your cause and uh, go and take him on in battle. Um, or you can send Morkin here on a quest to go steal the Ice Crown and do away with it, basically destroy it. Now, 
Um, if you defeat Doom Dark in battle, you've won. Uh, and if Morkin takes the Ice Crown and destroys it, you've also won. And some players will try and do both because uh, that's the you know, maximum satisfaction. By contrast, Doom Dark is basically trying to kill you and Morkin and also take control of a citadel right down in the south. And if, again, if I show you the map here, um, again, we're here at the moment. Um, if uh, Doom Dark reaches and captures this place here, this is called Zajikith or Zajikith or something like that, um, basically he's won. Uh, so that's the computer's objective. So what I'm going to do is just play a few rounds of the game, just so you kind of get the feel for it. So actually I'm going to send Luxor heading east. So he's going to move into the distance. And again, we can look back the way we came. Notice that when we get beyond a certain distance, we can't see the characters, but we can still see the tower. Uh, and again, if I move another space, we're now approaching the edge of the forest. And if I look back, um, there's the tower that we were at, even further away. Um, so notice that I can't, all I can see is what my characters can see. So it looks sort of looking east, he's now moving into the Plains of Blood. Now I happen to know there's an uh, army that we can recruit up there in that distant um, keep that we can see right on the edge of the horizon. And they're going to move in that direction. But I've run out of moves for Luxor today and I can't move him any further. Night has fallen, Luxor's game is over for today. So let's go back to Morkin. Now I need to send Morkin north. Uh, I'm going to go northwest because I happen to know that going directly north is a bit of a problem. Um, so let's go northeast. There's a chap there. Um, and Luke's, uh, Morkin may be able to recruit him. Let's find out. Um, I can recruit the Lord of Shadows. So I've just encountered another person. Um, apologies, my camera has lost its focus there because there's no focus on the screen. Um, I'm going to just recruit the Lord of Shadows. Hopefully that brings it back in. That's working fine. So I'm now the Lord of Shadows, but I actually want to go back to be Morkin for a moment. But Morkin has run out of moves for today. Um, so let's go to Corleth. Now Corleth is uh, also standing at the moon. I'm going to send him east as well. Um, and we'll probably catch up with Luxor at some point here. Um, although I think Luxor went uh, one step um, to the northeast. So I'm going to keep Corleth running um, east. Corleth gets a little bit of bonus in his movement because he is Fey. And when Fey are moving through the forest, they can move through the forest slightly quicker. So because there were a few forest moves there, Corleth got a bit of an advantage. Um, I'm going to send Rothron to the south because I know there's a chap down there that we can recruit as well. Um, and here we encounter some of the baddies in, in the Realm of Midnight. These are just sort of random things thrown away. These are the ice trolls, rather unpleasant folks who will just try and eat you. Um, and ahead we can see one of the other things in Lords of Midnight, one of the liths, uh, but we're not going to reach that today. So Luxor's out of moves, uh, Morkin is out of moves. Uh, Corleth is out of moves and Rothron is now out of moves. If we press M we can see we did recruit one other chap, uh, this chap by the name of Shadows, so let's go to him. Now Shadows' problem at the moment is he doesn't have a horse, um, so he won't be able to move as fast. Now I happen to know there are some horses in this direction, so what we can do is we can move on to the square where there's some horses and we can choose to seek and we found some horses. That's great news because the Shadows can now move a little bit quicker. Um, and head in the direction as well. Uh, but that's the last person we managed to recruit today. We can see there are some wolves ahead, and now we have to press the night button. And so we can see the classic phrase, or if the camera focuses, hopefully we can, um, night has fallen and the fowl are abroad. One day's passed since the War of the Solstice began. Now at this point, the computer is moving all of its characters. So it has a whole bunch of armies under its control with pre-programmed destinations to deal with. And um, as this emulation is, is pretty much accurate, um, it takes the computer quite a long time to do this. Um, <laughs> only a, yeah, perhaps a minute or so, but uh, it feels long by the standards of today. Um, and then we get the classic phrase back there. Um, again, hopefully the computer will focus at some point. Uh, do you want dawn? So yes, we do. And then we get another day. So let's go back to Luxor. Luxor is heading towards the Keep of Blood. Now I happen to know that here, at the Keep of Blood is Lord Blood. Um, so let's recruit him. In fact, we can recruit some men for Luxor, which is a useful thing because it gives him a little bit more um, uh, ability. So let's recruit Lord Blood. Uh, it jumps to Lord's Blood character who's looking north and, and Lord Blood is probably thinking, oh dear, uh, there's an enemy army um, heading towards me. This isn't good. Uh, so Luxor 
uh, can also see that because he's at the same location. Um, but typically here, um, it is possible actually to make a defense here at, on the Plains of Blood, but it's very, very difficult to do. Um, and typically it ends up with you being completely wiped out fairly fast. Um, so Luxor's there, um, and I shall send him. Uh, actually, what I'll do is I'll leave Luxor here with Lord Blood, and we'll watch as the enemy armies come towards us for the time being. Now Lux, uh, Morkin, on his quest, is still trying to head north to find where the Ice Crown is. Um, so he's got to cross this plain. And you can see there are wolves. Um, oh, there's wolves there as well. Actually, we can see an army over there, but that happens to be, this one over here, that happens to be our one of ours. That's actually um, Lord Shadows. And you can see he's moved out of this forest here, move across that landscape over there, and he's heading east, as we know. Um, Morkin's got the problem that he's now surrounded by wolves. Actually, there's some, um, that's a, a clear space there. I can move into that keep. Um, now I could, as you can see here, cross this mountain range, but the problem with crossing a mountain range is it's going to knacker you out extremely fast. Um, but you do want to try and avoid all of those wolves and things if possible, because when you're a solo character, it's very easy to get killed by them. Uh, let's go to Corleth. He'll be charging across uh, the, um, the Plains of Blood. And we can see there a slightly larger building. This is the Citadel of Shimmeral. Uh, which is one of the major lords in the game. There he is, and uh, I don't know if Corleth can actually recruit him. Yes, he can. That's excellent. So we can get the Lord of Shimmeril as well. Now, Shimmeril's looking northwest to the Plains of Blood. Now, if we look on the map, uh, where we've got actually got to, so this is where we started uh, here uh, at the Tower of Doom. So luxor has gone up here onto the Plains of Blood, and he's standing around about here uh, with Lord Blood. Um, Corleth has gone all the way across to here, the edge of the forest of Thrall, where, as you can see, the citadel of Shimmeril is marked as a, as a graphic, but it's not marked by name. And this was the big problem. Actually, no, it is. Sorry, I'm making a mistake. Citadel of Shimmeril, there it is. So it's marked. So some of these places were marked, but a lot of them weren't. So we can see here we've got Citadel of Shimmeril, so we've managed to find our way there. There's another one here of Marraketh, and another one here of Kumar, and of Ithron, and of Zajakith. So we know where to roughly head to. Uh, in terms of finding those sort of places. You can see it's taken us two days to get from there to there uh, with a fairly swift character. So you can kind of get a feel for how long it takes you to move around what is quite an enormous playing area, particularly for an 8-bit computer game. Um, and all the time the computer is moving stuff around up here. Now we don't know what's going on up here because, of course, we don't have any characters in that place. And the beauty, again, of Lords of Midnight is if we're not there, we can't see anything. So everything up here at the moment is a mystery to us, and we don't know what's going up here until we hear a little bit of news as to what might be going on in a few a night's time. So we've got the Lord of Shimmeral. We'll leave him there for the moment. Let's go back to Morkin. We've moved him. Uh, Corleth the Fae has done his moves. Rothron is heading south. And here we see one of the magical liths. Now, the liths have magical powers. And if we seek... Um, we have found, in this case, the Cup of Dreams, which brings new welcome. What that means is basically that uh, Rothron goes back to dawn and has his movement reset, which is a jolly handy thing to have. And we can go to the next lift and do the same sort of thing. In this case, uh, Rothron's found some guidance. A voice calls, looking for Farflame the Dragon Lord, you must seek the Ruin of Korup. Now, Farflame the Dragon Lord is a jolly useful chap to have on your side. Um, and the ruin of Koroth is somewhere north of where Rothron currently stands. And there's another bit of clue. So you begin to learn about the game from some of the lore stuff that's being told. Um, let's keep going south. Uh, let's find out what this lift gives us. Uh, seek. And the Cup of Dreams again. Fantastic. That means we can keep moving again. So it's back to dawn. So um, this is a really handy way of getting around the map. Um, and again, the Cup of Dreams. Fantastic. Um, there's another one here, uh, let's seek there. And we've got some guidance, oh, it's given us the same piece of information. Farflame, the Dragon Lord, can destroy the Ice Crown. Actually, no, it's not the same piece of information. So that's a very useful couple of clues we've just been given there. Told us where Farflame can be found, which is uh, Koroth, and he can also destroy the Ice Crown, which is a jolly handy thing to know. Um, and I'm gonna finish the move here by sending Rothron to this citadel here, quite a grand looking place. This is the Citadel of Guard, who I know we can also recruit. And we'll finish his move there and recruit the Lord of Guard. That gives us another character. Um, 
So now we can see that we've got a number of characters. We've got Guard, who we just recruited, we've got Shimmeral, we've got Shadows, and we've got Blood. Um, now, if we go back to Morkin for the moment, um, we're currently standing on the plains of Ogrim, looking northwest to the mountains of Ashimar. But if we look northeast within the uh, mountains of Dodrak, now I happen to know the north of the mountains of Dodrak is the land of Koroth, which is where Farflame the Dragon Lord lives. So with a bit of luck in the next day or so, we might be able to find him too. Let's find out what happens on the third day. So night has fallen once more. The fowl are abroad. Two days have passed since the War of the Solstice began. And again, we have to wait for the computer to move its character, which is now thinking about. Um, now, the battles between you know, Doomdark's characters and ours, uh, or some of the potential ones that we might be able to recruit, begin to happen usually between day three and day four. So it may be a little early to see anything at this point in time, but we'll see what happens um, as the computer does its move. Nothing, nothing bad's happened. Do you want Dawn? Yes, we do. So another day. So Luke's all standing at the Plains of Blood. Now things are not looking good at the Plains of Blood, as you can see. We have um, some armies moving direction. We can see at least four there. We've got one, two, three, four, possibly five at the background there, and they're coming down through. This is the gap of Valley Thor, and there's a citadel just beyond our line of sight where these, uh, um, these armies are emerging from. So I'm going to leave Luxor and Blood, because they're both in the same location, as you can see, uh, at the Keep of Blood, ostensibly to try and defend the Keep of Blood. Um, Morkin, however, is in the mountains of Dodrak. So let's see if we can shift through the mountains of Dodrak. Now, this is a, a long haul for him. Now, uh, although there's some dragons there, that's not actually good. Those dragons are just kind of hostile dragons, um, so we don't want to go that way. Um, unfortunately, going through the mountains um, takes a long time. You can see there we are now lost in the mountains of Dodrak, and uh, we only got three moves that day before night fell because moving through mountains is very, very tough, not surprisingly. Call of the Fae is at the Citadel of Shimmel. I'm going to send him northeast because I happen to know that in the forest of Thrall there is somebody we can recruit. Uh, though we've got problems with here with those wretched wolves about. Uh, let's see if we can find a way around them. Deep in the forest of Thrall is a village. Uh, let's see, the dragons are hanging around. Uh, there it is. And the village of Thrall has um, somebody we can recruit. We can recruit the Lord of Thrall. Um, so there's a surprise one that isn't really on the map. As you can see on the map, all there is really is just a big forest called Thrall. Um, there's no clue there that there's anybody inside it, so that's one of the things that you would discover as you were playing the game. So we've got the Lord of Thrall. Um, Rothron has recruited the uh, um, Lord of Guard, and you can see this is quite a nice part of the map actually here. Um, there's lots and lots of stuff going on. There's the uh, there's a Keep of Silence over there. This is actually an interesting one that we've had a little play with in the game, in the book, sorry, um, to explain why is there a Keep of Silence over there. So there's lots of little idiosyncrasies in, in Lords of Midnight, um, and some of those stories are told in the book. Now, you may have been noticing, as I swap between characters, we get different devices. These are the shields that the characters identify themselves with. Luxor has a moon and a star. Morkin has a moon and two drops of something. I'm not quite sure whether they're drops of oil or drops of something else. Um, Call of the Fae has an eagle. The eagle is the sign of the Fae. And Rothron has the eye and the eagle. So that's a kind of mixture of the Fae and the Wise, which are represented by the, the eye there. Um, Guard, as you can see, has a kind of kingly star, uh, perhaps a lion there. And Shimmerul has a lion, but in a different color. And Shadows, being a Fae, has an eagle, as you might expect. And Thrall will have an eagle as well, in a different color. Um, so every character has their own crest and their own um, uh, mannerisms. Uh, now, if we look at the descriptions of the character, you'll see something else. The, us the usual stuff is there about uh, what the time is and what the state of the character is. You can see it's dawn, Luxor's utterly invigorated. And here's another thing, the ice sphere is mild, and Luxor is utterly bold. Now, the ice sphere is an additional strategic aspect to the game. The ice sphere determines how well um, your character can kind of act. The ice sphere is, a, you know, as the name expects, is a, is a fear that is generated by Doomdark's ice crown, and it permeates the whole of Midnight. Now, Doomdark has the choice of focusing it in particular areas, 
or he can kind of spread it out widely and just give it as a general malaise. But what it does is if the ice sphere gets too strong, your characters get afraid. And if they get too afraid, they're unable to act, uh, which means they can get completely stuck and useless. So you can see here at the moment, the ice sphere is mild. Basically, as Doomdark gets, uh, begins to win and gets more and more confident, um, then the ice sphere will grow in strength. Now, at the moment, there hasn't been a battle, so the ice sphere has started that mild. Let's compare that to another character, the Lord of Shadows, where he is, um, and we think as him, we can see that it's dawn, Shadows is slightly tired, and the ice sphere is mild, and Shadows is bold. But he's not very bold. He's slightly less um, enthusiastic about things than Luxor is, because Luxor's obviously the top chap in charge. Um, Morkin will always be um, utterly bold because he's immune to the ice sphere. And that's because of his heritage by being half uh, human and half fae. He's immune to the ice sphere, which means he's the only person who can approach the ice crown and do away with it. Um, now, at this point in the game, we've discovered a few things. We know that Farflame, the Dragon Lord, can destroy the ice crown. Um, we know that he is to be found in the land of Korith somewhere. Um, so that's the quest part that Morkin is on. Uh, Luxor is uh, potentially making, hoping to do a defence of the Citadel, oh, sorry, the, the Keep of Blood. Let's try that tactic and we'll see how we go. So what I would do at this point is I've got a number of characters. I might think, right, Guard has got an army, shimmeral has got an army, Shadows has got an army, Thrall has got an army, and Blood has got an army. That's, that's five armies, that's not, that's not bad. So what we would do, let's send all of our armies to the Keep of Blood and try and defend it. So I'm going to do precisely that. Um, I'm going to seek here, you never know. I found the Waters of Life. That refreshes me, that's a jolly nice thing to have. Um, let's get our characters. So the good thing here is um, Lord of Shadows is going to arrive today. We can see our two lords, that's Luxor and Blood, at the Keeper Blood, and that has now reinforced our army. We've got three people there, which is great. And if I think about it, from Lord of Shadows' perspective, I can see that two hours of the day remain, we're all invigorated, we're all bold, the ice sphere is mild, um, 100 warriors of the Freer Guard in the Keep. Uh, Luxor the Moon Prince has got 300 warriors that we pinch from the Keep. Um, his warriors are slightly tired though, so that's not so good. Um, and Lord of Shadows himself has got 1,000 warriors. He hasn't got any riders. Um, and Lord Blood commands no warriors, but he's got 1,200 riders. So we've got an army of close to 2,000 already, which is great. So let's go and get Guard. Guard was recruited by Rothron. He's way down a little bit in the southeast. So we need to move him in the right direction. So I'm going to charge him up the map here um, towards um, Blood. But we're not going to make it today because it's a long route for us to travel. Uh, ditto Shimmeral. Now Shimmeral is down to the south uh, southeast of Guard. So let's head to the northwest and we'll be able to see there's Guard's Keep coming into view. And we can see the enemy armies beginning to head in our direction as well. And uh, unfortunately, Shimbrol hasn't made the keep today. Uh, didn't have enough hours in the day to get there, so he's now camped outside. Um, and uh, he won't make it until tomorrow. Thrall is in the forest of Thrall, surprisingly enough. So we're going to send him west. Uh, but he's even further away from um, blood. Uh, we need to deal with those pesky wolves. Um, and so we're going to send him a little bit northwest. Uh, we'll probably see. There we go. There's a, a lake. Uh, the lakes of midnight are an interesting thing. Uh, why are they there, and why haven't they frozen? Uh, that's an interesting thing. Now, if we look um, here again, we can see some armies. Now, these armies here, I happen to know, are the Doom Dark ones. This one's actually Shimmeral himself. So we know we left an army um, outside Blood's Keep. That is the army. That's uh, Lord Shimmeral. So Thrall hasn't made it today either, but. Reinforcements are on their way to Blood, and they should arrive tomorrow. So Guard we've done, Shimmer we've done, Shadows has arrived, Thrall's on his way, Blood is already there. Um, yeah, we've got a reasonable chance of putting up some sort of defence. Um, Morkin has had his move. Let's go back to Luxor. Luxor's already there, so we're not going to move him today. It's time for night once more. Night has fallen, the Fowler abroad, and three days have now passed since the war of the Solstice began. So again, we need to wait for the computer to make its move. And that takes a little bit of time. We'll see what happens. Um, now, with a bit of luck, we will now see some news come through 
from the computer. Because as it works out and starts encountering our characters, it'll have to start calculating some battles. And here we go. The bloody sword of battle, and apologies if you can't see that, the bloody sword of battle brings death in the domain of blood. No guesses for figuring out what's going on there then. So do you want Dawn? Yes, we do. Let's find out what's going on. So the armies that were ahead of Luxor have disappeared. So let's find out what happened at the Keep of Blood. So it's Dawn. Luxor's utterly invigorated. The ice fears miles. That sounds good. He's bold and he's still got the moon ring. 100 warriors of the free guard the keep. And Luke saw the Moon Prince command 300 warriors. So nothing's happened at the keep. So what's happened, I'm afraid, is that the armies may have gone around us and attacked one of our chaps. Although he seems to be... OK, we're looking there east to uh, Shimmerall, and we can see one of their other armies approaching over there as well. So let's find out. There definitely was a battle. So uh, Lord Shimmerall is slightly tired. The ice fear is mild. It doesn't ah there we go so in the battle of blood Shimmerall lost 20 riders and 25 warriors Shimmerall alone to lose 70 of the enemy and his riders threw 770 so that was a pretty good victory his warriors slew 265 and victory went to the free so there was a battle last night but it was at the gates of blood it wasn't actually at blood itself um the lord of Shimmerall uh, acquitted himself well and uh, he only lost a few warriors he's had a good fight excellent so let's move him into the keep of blood that's great news. What else has been going on? Well, we know Thrall was on his way and Guard was on his way. So let's move Guard. Guard is still a fair old way away from the action. We can see the forest there, which is the one inside which we started the game. And um, oh, let's go northeast. And we need to keep heading this way. And we're still not going to make it to um, the Keep of Guard. Uh, sorry, the Keep of Blood today. Lord, Blood, uh, Lord Guard is just too far away. But Thrall should be able to make it. Let's just check him. Uh, it's Dawn for him. Uh, Thrall's invigorated. Um, he didn't have a battle last night, which is good for him. So let's get him into uh, the Keep of Blood. So now as we look there, we can see that we've got a nice collection of people building up there. Um, which is great. So we now reinforce that. So Lord Thrall is there as well. Fantastic. Uh, we've got Shadows as well. So he was heading on to the Keep of Blood. No, he made it last time. Uh, Thrall's there. Blood's there. Shimmerall's there. Guard is the only one left now to move into that position. So let's go back to Morkin. He's still lost in the mountains. Um, so let's see if we can find our way through here. Uh, I think we may need a few more movements we can begin to see something going on over here which i happen to know is roughly where we need to go uh, but it's slogging your way through the mountains is slow as you can see it's night already call of the fey oh, he hasn't got an army so let's keep sending him east and we can just give you a little bit more um and we'll go that way the problem you always get these pesky wolves and things hanging around which uh, when you're a single character is really irritating because it's quite dangerous to go through them you can quite easily be killed um, so now we're emerging out of the forest. Um, let's see if we can get to this village, which we do. Uh, we'll seek, and we've found some shelter, and uh, we've been refreshed, which is jolly nice. Uh, Rothron, uh, to be honest, at this point, I'm not going to do anything more with him, but he's quite a useful character because he can go some quite long distances and recruit things as well. He's quite useful in the battle as well. Uh, let's leave Luxor. So let's do another night. Uh, so four days have passed since the War of the Solstice began and the computer is once again moving its characters about. And we just have to wait again for it to figure that sort of stuff out and we'll see what it comes up with this time. We'll probably find a few more battles are going on and we'll see what transpires. So it can be quite tense. Here we go. Um, the bloody sword of battle brings death in the domain of dreams and in Lorgrim. Okay, well, those are two areas where we don't have any characters, so um, unfortunately, whoever they are, those guys are on their own. Uh, Luxor's still standing, um, and interesting enough, the armies here um, are avoiding us. Um, so they're moving around um, the mountains there and heading towards the west. Those are Doomdark's armies, but they're not attacking us, which is an interesting move 
on the part of the computer. It may have detected the fact that we've, we're quite strong here. Um, so while we're doing that, let's move guard up in that general direction. There's the keep of blood at last. Um, there's all our characters. So we've got a nice sizable army there. Little guards made it after three days of traveling. Uh, so he'll probably be a little bit tired. Um, let's keep poor old Morkin chomping through the mountains now. Here we go. He stands in the mountains of Dodrak, looking north to the Tower of Koroth. Now we are in the land of Koroth. And I happen to know exactly where to look, because I've played this game before. At the village of Koroth, ahead. Uh, nope, sorry, it's not that one. It's there. A single dragon in the space ahead. Now, as you play the game, you might have thought, oh, that looks dangerous. But a single dragon is good news, because it is Farflame the Dragon Lord. Let's recruit him. We now have Farflame the Dragon Lord, and we now have all the elements we need to actually defeat the game. Because as we were told by Rothron, as he found out, Farflame the Dragon Lord can destroy the Ice Crown. Morkin is the only person who can go and get the Ice Crown, and so all we need to do is get Morkin and Farflame onto the same spot once Morkin has retrieved the Ice Crown and we'll win the quest. Luxor, meanwhile, is battling the armies, and what we should really be doing is um, you know, recruiting lots and lots and lots and lots more lords um, to make sure that we've got enough, because actually, although we've got six of our characters here, that's no way near enough for us to defeat Doomdark um, by force of conquest. Let's give it one more night, um, just to see if any interesting battles take place, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll quit um, and, and go on from there. Now, the interesting thing, I was playing this game a couple of times this afternoon just to kind of get the feel for what was going on. And every single time, although I was trying to do the same things because I want to show you guys how it works, um, the computer was playing completely differently every single time, which was quite interesting. Um, you know, the, the amount of variety that you get out of the game. The replay value of this is immense because um, there is no uh, way that the game is ever similar again. Doomdark seems to do something completely different every time. Uh, depending on you know, random factors or where he thinks that your power is and so on and so forth. So um, every time you play this game something different happens which is great fun. Um, so at the moment we've got all sorts of stuff going on. The Bloody Sword of Battle brings death in the domain of Dreams and of Kor and of Herath and of Lorgrim and of Ithril and of Dodrak. Ah, and that's not good news. And of Blood. So Dodrak is where Morkin and Farflame are and Blood is obviously where Luxor and his armies are. So. Um, I happen to know that Doomdark does send armies after Morkin because obviously he's a major threat, so it would be very sensible to do so. It sounds like they may have found him. So Luke Saw uh, is standing at the Keep of Blood. What happened there? Um, doesn't sound like there's been a battle actually at the Keep. Okay, so we'll leave that. Morkin is standing in the ruins of Koroth. Um, and Morkin's invigorated. Um, Morkin doesn't command anybody, and neither does Farfam. It doesn't seem that there's been a battle, so maybe there were some other um, keeps or something in this general vicinity. But what that means is that we are definitely being hunted. Um, so if we're going to have to move somewhere, then we need to get going. So let's send Morkin northwest, get him out of the mountains, and we'll make sure that Farflame sticks with him um, to kind of protect him. And there he is. Now, Mork, uh, Farflim doesn't run out of moves because he's a dragon. He can fly much, much further than uh, Morkin can, can ride his horse. Um, so we'll do that. Um, so again, let's just give it one more night. Uh, maybe we'll take it to a week, actually. Let's see if we can get to seven days. Um, by which point you're usually either losing or managing to stay pace with the game. Um, we'll see how that goes. Night has fallen and the Fowler abroad, and six days have passed since the War of the Solstice began. So all those strategy elements combined, you've got a massive map, um, the ability only to see what the characters you've recruited can see, the ice sphere, um, your characters can get exhausted, uh, you know, um, and there are various magical powers around the map, and you've got to kind of work out what the law of the game is as you're playing. Um, and you tended, um, with Lords of Midnight, to fail fast and fail quickly, because there's so much you had to learn in order to know and win the game that the replay value 
um, was, was immense. Uh, but it took you many, many attempts to, to get it right because you, every time you lost, you were learning something new about it. So here again, Bloody Sword of Battle, bringing death and domain of Kor and Ithril and Ithril and Marikith. Those are not the locations where any of our characters that we've got um, are, are at. But as you can see here, this is Luke Saw's view. He's looking north to the Plains of Blood. There's a major battle, uh, I think, coming our way. Morkin seems to be good. Um, we'll, we'll send him north one more day. Um, this is Lake Miro, which I happen to know is another place where you can destroy the Anish Crown. And um, ahead is the forest of Lotharul, where I happen to know is another Fey uh, gentleman. And we will be able to recruit him. So let's send Far Flame up there as well. Uh, he's a useful person to have in the fight, as you can imagine. A full large dragon. Um, where's Morkin gone? There he is. So keep them in the same place. And we have um, Luke Saw and his crew uh, in that central place as well. Uh, so let's just end the first week uh, and we'll see where we are. Now if I just go back to the map very briefly while the computer's calculating, um, just to give you a sense of where we've got to. So Luke Saw and co are here. Um, Morkin has gone up through this mountain range. He's actually managed to reach the edge of the forest of Lotharal, which is kind of up here. So that's the distance Morkin has managed to travel so far in the game. Luxor and the other co are really just over here, which is not far from the origin. Guard, by the way, was, was down here. So you get a feel for the scale of the map. We only really explored this left quadrant here at the moment. All this area here is left for us to explore. And that's been a week, if you like, in the game so far. Uh, we've got Bloody Death again uh, in the domain of blood, core, hereth, ithril, and blood. Um, interesting, the game <laughs> repeats it, which is a nice little touch. Um, just one of those kind of things of the game that, that happens. And um, we can see that uh, things are not looking good for Luxor at this point. Let's find out if they actually did fight a battle. Uh, yes, here we go. So in the Battle of Blood, Luxor lost no warriors. Luxor alone slew 105 of the enemy. He's doing pretty well. His warriors slew 140, and victory went to the free. That's fantastic news. So there we go. So Luxor's fighting the good fight. Morkin is still alive and heading north. And um, we can go on through there. He's got to sneak through a mountain range, um, not far away from here now, and get to the Ice Crown. Um, and with Far Flame, uh, kind of push it onwards. But that will take us a good another. Um, 15, 20 minutes to play it through. So um, what I aim to do there is just kind of give you a taster of how the game actually played. So you've got some context for why somebody would want to write a novel about it. And in my next kind of video, I will take you through um, how we've kind of approached that and what we're doing with it. So that was, that was Lords of Midnight, um, and we will be back in another episode before too long. Thank you very much.